Listen, if you would uh, go in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 43. Isaiah chapter 43. <clears throat> Lord has put something on my heart. I, I think this saying applies to uh, marriages. If I'm wrong, that I'm sure you'll let me know. But it's uh, a, a twist. The, the, the title of the message is Nothing Old, Something New, Nothing Borrowed, nothing blue. And um, turn your Bibles with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. It says this, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. That's in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19. Let's pray, church. Father, throughout this week, you have been speaking this truth to my heart. I ask you now to help me in, in, in sharing this with these people that you love so dearly. Holy Spirit, I, I, I ask you to do what you do so well. Speak truth to us. Your truth sets us free. Your truth can not only set us free from bondages of addiction, but... Your truth can set us free from religion, can set us free from the past. Father, I, I know that if we will hear your voice and be set free, one thing we can do is we can enlarge in our borders to begin to see you bigger than what we think you are. And so, Father, I take authority over every demonic spirit that would hinder. I pray for a, a clarity and a directness. I pray that you capture our heart this morning, Father. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Behold, I was surprised in, in preparing for this that to find that that word behold is actually used 1,296 times in Scripture. Behold means to, to look, to focus your attention, to engage. Think about that. 1,296 times in Scripture, <clears throat> God reaches out to us. He has something for us. And he's reaching out to us to, so that we can engage it. I really feel in my heart this is a, a message for this hour. It's not just the message for today. It's the message for this hour. Behold, God is speaking to us. I, a lot of places I, on Facebook and in conversations with people, there's a debate as to whether this presence is the the work of God or the result of the efforts of the enemy. Here's much I can tell you. My God is a God of life and not death. There are no fingerprints of God on this pandemic. If your God is a God who brings disease and destruction, then you and I don't serve the same God. He is a God of life. I believe that this pandemic is either the result of the prevailing sin in our world. The wages of sin is death. Let's not forget that. God doesn't pay us with death. 
Sin pays us with death. And let's not kid ourselves. We've wandered far from what God's called us to be. And so let's quit allowing this to be placed on God. God is not a God of death. He is a God of life. He's a God who wants to do good things and, and, and to be a blessing to us. But God is also able to take that which was designed or meant for our evil and use it for our good. Listen to me, church. I'm telling you everything I hear the Spirit of God saying to me that if we're not careful and worrying about what the enemy is doing, we'll miss what God is about to do. God is active right now. There's a real moving in my spirit about, and there's an apprehension and an anticipation about God doing something. And throughout this week, he kept saying that word to me, behold, I'm challenging you because he's challenged me. He's doing something. And in, 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 in fact, it may just be that because the enemy <coughs> saw what God was about to do, he released this pandemic to get our focus and attention off of God. I want to tell you something. God is at move here. Do not be so consumed with a spirit of fear and doubt and worry that you miss what God is doing. God is reaching out to his people. He's the same God now as he was on January 1st of this year, as he was 10 years ago, as he always will be. He's absolutely God. And he says, behold, I... Listen, we've, if you've lived long enough, you've seen man-made revival. You've seen man try to stir up and create an awakening. You've seen manufactured moves of the Spirit of God. God wants you to know something. We haven't fully seen anything like what he's about to do. God said, behold, stop what you're doing. Focus your attention. I. There will be no man who will get glory from what God is about to do. <clears throat> it will not be con <clears throat> contained in a place. It will not be constrained by geography. It will not come from the high and the mighty those people who are quick to put their fingerprints on what God did, God is going to use the average person, the below average person, people like you and I, people that know that but for God, we're garbage. But for God, we're nothing. But for God, we're nobody. It will be those people that he works through. It will be those people who wouldn't dare touch what solely belongs to God. He will do it. Those people who know that in them dwells no good thing. And when a miracle happens in front of their eyes, they will know, I didn't do that. God did that. Those people who are satisfied to have a front seat to what God's doing, those are the people that are going to engage in this. Behold, I. That's God speaking. Behold, I will. I want you to know something. He wills to do this. This is a promise. God is a God of promise who fulfills his promises. 
and he is looking the church in the face and he's telling us to look. Behold, I will. That's his word. It's his bond. It's his signature written in the blood of Jesus Christ on the tablets of our heart. It's God saying that what I'm about to tell you, you don't have to guess about it going to happen. I will personally see to it. I will personally see to that fact that what I'm saying is about to happen will happen. Scripture tells us that God watches over his word to perform it. Behold, I will do a new thing. This is where it gets a little bit ugly, church. A new thing. It don't look like anything he's ever done before. It's a new thing. And I'm going to tell you about a new thing. We humans, we like the same. I have a, um, up in Middlefield, Ohio, there's the Middlefield Cheese Factory. And you can go in there and you can get a sandwich, a great sandwich, for I think it's two dollars and seventy five cents, and um I went in there a while back and um i've I've gotten to know them, and I went in one day and i, I I'm a man of routine i I go in the door, I use a restroom, I wash my hands, I come out, I grab my drink, my bag of potato chips, and I go up and order my two dollars and thirty five cent sandwich. And one day when I was in there, I was joking and, and fussing at them. I said to them, you know, you, you, you've seen me come in here before. I order the same sandwich every time. Is there a reason why I have to stand here and wait while you make it? Is there is there a reason why I can't just walk in here and get my sandwich? And, and you know, Amish people aren't known for their sense of humor, but, but she somewhat laughed at it. And... Um, um, the next time I went in there, as I walk up to the counter, the little Amish lady behind the counter was kind of smiling. And she said, can I help you? And I ordered my sandwich and she reached down and she put it up on the counter. It was already done and wrapped. I'm being told that it's called the Middle che Middlefield Cheese Co-op. Original Cheese, Original cheese Co-op. And, and there she had my sandwich ready. I, just like all of you, I, I, I like routine. And we humans are, are such that God has to make us uncomfortable so that we change. And I, I know this much about God. When, when I'm uncomfortable, I've learned now to start looking to see what it is he wants me to change. Anybody else out comfortable? Anybody else out there uncomfortable? So if we're uncomfortable, guess what? It's a sign that God wants to change. I, I I've read that um, eagles when they when they make a nest, one of the things they will do before they lay their eggs is they will line the inside of the next nest with animal fur. A squirrel or a rabbit and it's a comfortable place and and when the baby eaglet hatches it's it's got a comfortable place to to reside and and that will be its life for a while but when the the, the parent eagles now want the little eaglet to leave the nest they, they will pull the fur out and throw it over the side of the nest so now it's uncomfortable for that eaglet and now the eaglet has to do something it's never done before. Fly. And I think that, that God is reaching out to the church and telling us, up till now, you've, you've, you've stood and you've walked and you've run, but 
Now it's time to fly. He's going to do a new thing. Listen, church, it's not the old thing redone. A new thing is not a different evangelist or a different pastor. It's a new thing. Old, the same old people, but a new thing. It's, it's church the way we've never done it before. It's being the church instead of having church. It's, it's more than doing church because it needs to even transcend that, doing church. It's being the church that you and I come to realize that every breath that we take is a gift from God. And even like the birds, you know, last night it was it was warm enough that I, I slept with the sliding glass door open in my, my bedroom and our bedroom and and early this morning it was still dark out and the birds were already singing. I think we ought to be like that. I I think we ought to be worshiping God and praising God even when it's dark in life. I think we ought to just be 24 hours a day. Our breath our breath ought to be ready to destroy the works of the enemy because it comes becomes a kind word into somebody's life. It becomes a prophecy to somebody. It becomes a a a prayer. Listen church, we need to get to the place that as you're going through your day, if God brings to your mind somebody, pray for them that moment. That very moment, you don't have to go lock yourself away. You, you can be taking a walk and somebody comes to your heart and you just pray. You just, in that moment, you just pray for them. You just pray for them. I have a gentleman that I'm in, engaged with. He's physically in very, very bad shape. The doctors have literally sent him home to die. And I remember sitting in the hospital room with him and he um, he was struggling just to carry on a conversation. He wasn't even lucid. And in that moment, I heard the Lord say something to me. And I looked at this man that I literally thought at any moment he could pass in front of my eyes. I don't know that I will ever see him alive again. That's how bad he looked. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit told me to tell him that yes, he will die, but not of this and not now. 11 days later, he was released from the hospital. He's still convalescing at home. They're still speaking death over him. And I've gone to visit him. I spoke to him for hours on end on the phone. And uh, this is a guy who at one time was very passionate in his relationship with God and some hurts and things happened and he's wandered away. And I remember trying to have a conversation with him and it was frustrating because he, he would take minutes to say what normally should have taken moments. And as I hung on the phone, I felt the press of the Spirit of God to just be praying for him. And we talked, and he was sharing some of his past hurts, and he was sharing his failures as a man, as a minister. And he said, I just feel, Mike, like I've gone too far. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit gave me a word for him. I said, there is no way you've gone too far. Because if your ability to sin is greater than God's ability to forgive you, that makes you God. And my friend, you're not God. I'll never forget this moment as long as I live. With clarity and a distinctness in his voice, he said, hold on. Say that again. And I said, if your ability to sin is greater than God's ability to forgive you, that makes you God. And folks, I've, I've multiple conversations with him since then. 
He's getting better and better. We're having conversations. He actually makes sense. And he's sharing with me. We're talking about scriptures. Listen, folks, don't delay. This is not the day and the hour when you and I are to be disobedient children. If God puts something on your heart, obey him quickly. Speak to that situation that he's brought to your heart. Call that individual. Pray for that individual. Text them. Send them a card. Send them an email. The Spirit of God tells you to visit, then go visit. But obey the Spirit of the Lord. He's doing a new thing. If you're not uncomfortable, you're not involved with a new thing. It's going to feel like new shoes. They don't quite fit. It, God's taking the church out of its comfort zone. We have been too comfortable for too long. He's calling us out of our comfort zone. And he's wanting you and I just to be genuine. Just to be real. I saw an article this week that had made me laugh. Some, and I, I, I wish I could tell you where it was at. I don't remember. But this individual that, that wrote the article, it was either Christianity Today or Charisma Life magazine. I read it online. They... they um, uh, we're challenging pastors with so many pastors in, in America and around the world going online. They challenged pastor in this article to get out of their routine of preaching at their church to their congregation. And they said, if, if I'm hearing God, you, you ought to be preaching from your living room. You ought to be talking to your people on a natural, normal level. And the fact that you're uncomfortable with that speaks about some changes that need to happen in your life. We've been doing that all along. Listen, God's going to do a new thing. It is not a time for you and I to say, well, we've never done it that way before. That used to be used as a reason not to do something, now it's the reason to do something. We've never done that before. So it's a new thing. If you're hoping for life and church life to go back to whatever normal is, stop. Don't ask God to take us back to normal. Don't ask God to take us back to natural. Ask God to take us into the supernatural to where you and I are laying hands on the sick and you are seeing them recover right then, right that moment. You're seeing restoration in people. You're seeing bondages broken right now. That's the will of God. God would have you and I to speak with a new tongue. Stop with the anger and the cursing. Stop with the double-mindedness. Stop with the playing games. Speak the heart of the Father. Make sure you take time every day to get to the Father's heart so you can give the Father's heart. That's a new thing for you. It's a new thing for us. We need to be doing that. And then he says, Now, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring. Get ready for suddenlies. Get ready for suddenlies, church. Get ready for instantaneous opportunities. Get ready for everyday opportunities. Don't, don't, we, we get to the place where we think we have to wait till church service and and get somebody with a need at a church service. And then, you know, when the, when the singing is done and the preaching is done and then there's altar service and, and then we'll take them and get them healed or delivered. No, 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 no. Lay hands on them right now, right where you are. Get this in your head. Your footsteps have been ordered by God. If you find yourself in front of somebody 
who has a need and they're in front of you, take this to the bank. They're in front of you because God is trusting you to pray for them or to speak to them in that very moment. Not later and not Pastor Rice or, or somebody else. God put you. He put you there in that moment. There in front of you, God has brought one of his struggling children and he's placing them in front of you and he's saying to you, would you help them? Don't, don't turn them aside. Don't move on to something else. Don't wait for a better time. If there was a better time, then that moment would have happened in a better time. God is saying, this is the best time right now. Stop what you're doing. It doesn't, you know, listen, I understand being caught up in that religion stuff. I was with a guy who had attended our church for several months. God had invaded his family and he'd seen a number of his family members get saved, but he was a very analytical thinking type man. And, and he started coming to church, but he, he stayed back. He stayed back. And finally one day he said, Pastor, can 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 we have lunch? I want to talk to you. And so I went to Bob Evans uh, in the town where we pastored. They they knew me there. I had a lot of uh, meetings with people there. And um, I met with him and we, we had lunch and he asked questions and I, I did my best on the Lord to answer his questions. And he was, it was almost like Nicodemus. He was asking, what does it mean to be saved? Why? How does it happen? And and we got done. He said, all right, pastor, I'm ready. I said, you're ready? He said, yeah, I'm ready to pray. I said, okay, man, let's let's get the bill and, and get paid. And we'll go out to my car. And he said, no, I'm, I'm ready to pray right now. I said, you're ready to pray? We're in a restaurant, man. <laughs> Can you believe me saying that? He said, I'm ready to pray right now. And I see him start to tear up. He said, I don't know what to pray. Can you help me? And I said, sure, I can help you. And so right there in the middle of that, that Bob Evans restaurant, people all around us, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll help you to pray. I said, by your head. I said, dear Lord. And he said back real loud, dear Lord. <laughs> and I said, not so loud. He goes, not so loud. <laughs> Uh, God has a way of tweaking me sometimes. Um, we need to be instant, folks. Instant in season. Instant in season. If there is a need in front of you, it's because God sent that need to you. Some of you have said you want to see miracles. You want to see, you want to, you want to have stories. I, I'll tell you where the story lies. Get out of your comfort zone. If you keep doing what you've always done, you'll always have what you've always had. If you want a story, if you want a front row to a miracle, it'll be in front of you later today, tomorrow. It'll happen. God brings somebody to your mind out of nowhere, pick up the phone and call them. Do what God is telling you to do and you will have a story. He said, now it will spring forth. They're going to be suddenlies. You'll just be going through your day and then suddenly there's something happening in front of you. Know this. God put you in that situation for a purpose. And then he asked a question. Shall you not know it? He's asking you and I to engage and we need to decide. Are we going to engage? There is a move of God that's already beginning to start. We don't have to wait for it to come. It's already starting, folks. It's already starting. There's a move of God already starting. And God is asking you and I, are we going to engage in it? Are we going to be plugged into it? You have to decide it for yourself. I have to decide it for myself. We all have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord. My relationship with God is based on me and God, nobody else. And God's asking you a question. Will you? Will you get out of your comfort zone? 
You know, when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, and he led them through the desert, a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of smoke, I'm sorry, a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. And and that those pillars would move and then they would become stationary. And and it would stay stationary for a while. And you can imagine that you become stationary for a while that they become comfortable. They 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 know where to gather. They know they know what to do. They've set up their tents. They've got comfortable. But then there came a time when the pillars would begin to move again. And there would be people who would, I like it here. I don't want to move. Years ago, I was asked about why are there so many denominations? I'll, I'll tell you why there's so many. God, who is a moving God, an active God, he does something and there are those who want to stay there. They, 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 they don't want to move on with God as he does something new. Listen, he'll never do something outside the confines of his word. But there's things about the word of God that we don't yet know. There are hidden things. There are things that we will come to understand. And, and the scripture says that when the enemy comes in, then like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. There are things in the word of God that are yet to be released to the body. There are truths that are yet to be released to the body. He will never act outside of the confines of his word. But if you think you know, if you think we know everything about the word of God, you don't understand. I think that this great last move of God is going to be de depicted most perfectly in the one book of the Bible that many question whether or not it even should be there, the Song of Solomon. Isn't it just like God to take the stone that was cast aside and make it the chief cornerstone? Isn't it just like God to take a little boy to slay a giant? Isn't it just like God to take a little boy's lunch and feed thousands? And wouldn't it be just like God to take a book that some have said that it has no business in Scripture, that it never should have been included, and in the last days reveal truth out of that book that the church never knew before? I know this much. I know for years my wife and I have been praying for God to put the awe and the wonder back into the church. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, and they were in awe and they wondered at what God was doing. Several years ago, as I was praying that, God put the awe and the wonder back in your church. Redo Acts chapter 2. And God stopped me and he said, Son, my move will look less like Acts chapter 2 and more like the Song of Solomon. Wow. I think there are truths in the Song of Solomon that haven't been revealed to the body yet. God's asking you and I, will we get out of our comfort zone? Will we do things that we're not used to doing? And will we be somebody different than we're used to being? That's what God is asking. Will you not know it? Shall you not know it? I've always thought that's what that verse meant, and it does. And literally it wasn't until last night as I was wrapping this up and making sure that I, I was as ready as I could be that God showed me another sight of this. Shall you not know it? He said, I will do a new thing. Shall you not know it? And here's what he said to me. There will be no doubt it's me. That's also what that verse means. You think I'm going to do something and you don't know it's me? Oh, you'll know it's me. You'll know it's me. You've never seen anything like this. I've, I've never done this before. Listen, it's God who said it was a new thing. I know there's some people going to hear this and get all twerked because I said God said he'd never done this before. I didn't say it was a new thing. God did. 
okay? And I believe that everything that God says is true. And if he says this is a new thing, it's not only a new thing for you and I, it's a new thing for him. So get out of the structure what you think God's confined to. He's confined to his word. And I believe there are things in his word that are yet to be revealed, and they're going to be new things. Be careful. There will be false prophets out there. There will be false Jesus out there working and doing things that are contrary to the word of God. Not contrary to your religion, not contrary to your tradition, it'll be contrary to the word of God. What God is going to be doing is contrary to our tradition, is contrary to our habits, is contrary to our past. I, I thank God, I, I think down through the years of all the people that Gail, Beth, and I have have been blessed to be engaged with. And I thank God for every opportunity we've had. But I would trade all of that in for what he has for us. And he's looking for people who are not satisfied with what they had. He's looking for people who have a hunger for more. They want more. He said, you think I'm going to do something and you don't know it's me? <laughs> You'll know it. Man, he's going to show himself big, people. You'll have no doubt this is God. It won't be tagged to a denomination. It won't be tagged to a person. Listen, it won't be tagged to a place. Don't start saving up money for when God something happens somewhere else that you're going to travel to it. No, 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 no. This is home delivery, okay? This is home delivery. It's not going to be someplace you go to, there's an outpouring there. In the last days, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. That's what it says. All flesh. Sons and daughters, old men, young men. I'm you know, let's let's get rid of that word generations. There are no generations, folks. There's one generation right now. This generation has old people in it. It has young people in it. It has middle-aged people in it. It's had white people, black people, yellow people, red people, brown people. It has males. It has females. It has smart people. It has people that aren't so smart. It has good-looking people. It has people like me. It has all sorts of people in it. Okay? And so get out of the confines of what God's going to do and what it's going to look like. He's going to mess up your traditions, yeah. to mess up your religion. And if you find yourself saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, we've never done that before, jump on that. <laughs> if it doesn't offend the word of God, jump on that. And then he, 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 he closes this verse out with this. I will make a road in the wilderness. You know what the wilderness is? Wilderness is a lonely place. It's a place that, that there's nobody there. Listen to me, church, for a moment. It's a place where it's barren. And and you you make a road somewhere because you expect there to be traffic. Some of you need to quit cursing your lip. There are things you are learning in your wilderness that you could have never learned anywhere else. And God is going to build a road to your wilderness. He's going to bring people and put them in front of you who are going into the wilderness as you're exiting the wilderness. And you can be their guide and you can be their help. He's expecting to traffic in your wilderness places. He's expecting, listen, you, some of you have paid a big price to get where you're at. 
You've paid an expensive price to still be standing. The enemy counted you out many, many times, and yet there you are. And you know that God is with you. And you know that God is for you or you wouldn't still be standing. That pain will not go wasted. That pain will not be wasted. He's going to build a road in the wilderness. He's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. He's going to make rivers in the desert. You, you know those dry places in your life? You know those places that are just abandoned and alone and dry? Rivers, people. Rivers bring life. Not only do rivers bring life, rivers lead you to life. Listen, if you're ever lost in, 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 in the woods, if you're ever lost in a place and you can't find your way out, the number one rule to guide is to find a river and then follow that river downstream because cities were built around rivers. And the adage is, if you find rivers, you will find people. He is going to build rivers in the desert. He's going to build rivers where it was dry. And in that place in your life that you kind of shut off, you never thought, you never thought would, would benefit you. you. That was just a, a bad place in your life. You just wish it had never happened. He's going to build a river there. Listen to me. Rivers don't flow uphill. Rivers flow in the low places. And that you're going to find that, that rivers will flow in the low places of your life. You got, you got to be willing to be vulnerable. You got to be willing to minister through your pain and minister from your pain. Can I tell you the best way to get rid of your pain is to minister it away. Let it become fuel to the fire that's inside of you. The enemy has exacted this pain on you. It's about time you pay him back. It's about time you take some of what is his and you take it back from him. He stole it from you. He stole your joy from you with this wilderness. He stole your joy from you with this desert. And he wants you to mourn the desert and, and curse the wilderness. And God is saying, I'm going to make a road in your wilderness. And I'm going to put a river into your desert. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell cannot withstand that onslaught. We are that church. And we need to take what God has given us and what he's about to give us and attack hell with it. When you see somebody suffering, speak life into them. When you see struggle, speak to them, pray for them. Prior verse to what we read, verse 18 says this, Do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Do not remember them. Do not try to take this new wine and put it into an old wineskin. It will work. The wineskin will burst and what God gave you will be spilled out on the ground. I, I want to ask you to, to join me in prayer in just a moment that God would give you and I new wineskins. Give us hearts that are not hard, but hearts that are pliable. Spirits that are pliable to whatever God has for us. Amen? Let's pray, church. Father, I just come to you now in Jesus' name. And I, 
I pray for a heart that's pliable, God. God, if you find a place in our heart that is hardened by hurt and hardened by a scar, I, I ask you to, by, to soften it with the oil of your Holy Spirit. Father, some of our hearts are like old leather that is dried up. I just pray for oil. I pray for oil, God. Father, I feel like I'm speaking to somebody whose heart is hardened because they've been done wrong and they've been lied to and they've been cheated. And Father, I just speak life into them right now. I pray for the oil of your Holy Spirit to soften their heart. Only a heart that's soft, God, can expand and accept something new. God, help us to know that as long as we hold on to what has happened, will never be a part of what you're doing. And so, God, I just pray for our hearts to be softened by you. I pray for our hearts to, to hunger after you, to burn after you, God. God, I don't want this, this awakening, this move to pass us by. You're going to do incredible exploits, God. You're going to do incredible things. And I, I want a front row seat to that, Father. I, I want a front row seat to that. I I want to see lives change in front of me. I, I thank you for every opportunity I've had for that. I want more, God. This is one place, God, that you don't mind us being selfish. We want more of you. We want more of you, God. And I just pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that become our experience. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you, church.